Hey everyone, thanks for watching this or listening to this. So glad that you are part of Village Church. Please get involved in what God is doing here. This is villagechurch.com has everything that we're doing as a ministry and ways that you can get involved. Uh, if you want to help, if you want to give, if you want to resource what we're doing, the mission across the world that we're doing, we would love that. Uh, we have a lot of needs in that area. It'd be awesome if you joined us. Uh, this is villagechurch.com slash give would be great so we can be hitting budget blessing as many people as possible. And then we want you to actually get in a community group too. So this is villagechurch.com slash groups is the way that you can do that. We are so glad that you are listening, watching this. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Hey, Village Church, so glad you are here and we are gathered again. So if you are in one of our physical gatherings, special welcome to you. We are back. It is so good. Uh, or if you're joining us online, good to have you. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here at the church and it is always good to open the Bible with you. If you've got a Bible, please open it. John chapter six is where we are. We are done chapter five. That was like four or five weeks in one chapter. One of the greatest sermons ever. Now we flip over to something that happens in Jesus' ministry that it's, it's crazy. It's, it's one of the most popular things in his entire ministry. He feeds 5,000 people with nothing but a couple fish and five loaves of bread. We're going to get into what that even looks like because it's not loaves and it's not fish the way we think. This whole story is kind of maybe not what we think it is. And we're going to get into that but where we've seen it in movies and we're, we're going we're gonna to rethink it, rejig it a little bit because that's kind of what we do here at Village Church. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. So this is uh, one of the most important stories in all of Jesus' life. Mo one of the most important things he does in his ministry, feeding 5,000 people uh, with nothing in the middle of the wilderness. Uh, because, And the reason we know it's important is because it is the only miracle outside the resurrection that is actually shared in all four Gospels. It is the only thing. So it's this story is the only one because oftentimes Matthew, Mark, and Luke They'll tell like a bunch of the same miracle stories, but John doesn't mention any of those. This is the only one that all four of them actually tell, even the walking on water, which comes later in, um, in this text uh, that, that we'll cover next week or the week after, um, that Luke never tells that story. So this is the only one other than the resurrection of Jesus that all four of them actually tell. That's how we know what's important. Also, it has, by, by sheer number, it affects the most amount of people. John tells us that 5,000 people, and then Mark later tells us that men, he, he, uh, he, he makes a distinction and says 5,000 men. And so most scholars recognize the text is honing in on how many men were there, but there was kids, there was women there. So probably 10, 15, 20,000 people potentially are there gathered in the wilderness listening to this preacher and he's try. he goes, I, I, these people need to eat. And he takes this little kid's lunch, a couple fish, a <clears throat> couple pieces of bread, and he multiplies it out and he feeds all 10, 15, 20,000 people. So picture a big baseball stadium, ram full of people. He takes almost nothing and he feeds everybody. And then the disciples go out and bring back 12 baskets. Now, even that we're going to rethink if we get to it today, where baskets, like, it's not what we think it is. So, so this story uh, has lived in the last 2,000 years as one of the great moments. And there's this kind of understanding of what it is and then there's like the details of what it means for you and me as we live our life. So one of the backdrops of it, if, if you look at uh, verse four of John chapter six, uh, John tells us that uh, this event took place during the Passover. Even that backdrop is important because for those, see, if we're Gentiles, if we're just regular Canadian Joes and we don't know anything about Jewish history, we don't have the Old Testament playing its piano in the background of our mind, we miss the fact that the Passover was the moment in the Old Testament that the Jews celebrated every year. It was the focus of their life. It was, it was Christmas Eve. It was, it was the 4th of July. It was, and, and, and what it was, it was about God saving Israel. They were slaves in Egypt brings them through the waters of the Red Sea. They go out into the wilderness and they have nothing to eat. And so God takes them and feeds them bread from heaven uh, called manna in the wilderness. And manna, literally, he puts bread out every day for them on and then they go and collect it and then it disappears by the afternoon. And so it's, you know, the Lord's prayer, give us today our daily bread. It's this sense of let's, God, could you do again for us 
what you did for Israel and that you gave bread to them from heaven every day that they had to collect. Literally, the Hebrew word for bread is what is it, which is hilarious. It's like, well, it was like, what is it? And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's a good name for it. All right, what is it? It's like, I know, but I'm just saying who's on first. Yeah, why, but who? You know, it's like manna. What is it? Well, what is it? It's manna. But what's manna mean? What is it? So it's like this. So God literally provides bread for his people in the wilderness when they're hungry, in the Old Testament, in the greatest of all stories, the Exodus story. And now Jesus comes and does the same thing. He is saying a continuation of his proofs that he is Yahweh. He is God who has shown up in person and he's doing for the world what God did for Israel. It's this many layered thing that is a beautiful reality once we understand what Jesus is saying because he's gonna go on to then define later on in the chapter, I am the bread of heaven. And these people are like, what is happening? How is this even possible? What's going on? So let's get into the details of the story. That's kind of 30,000 foot vision of what actually happens. Later on, Jesus explains what it all means. Let's get into the details verse by verse. After this, meaning after the big sermon that Jesus just preached, this is verse one, chapter six, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. I love this. So he's in the prime of his, his stuff, he's preaching, people are all around him, and he goes away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, moves away from the crowd for a minute, and just needs some rest, needs to hang out with the disciples, go away, pray a bit. He's just preached this sermon, one of the greatest sermons in the New Testament. Uh, um, there was a study done that showed the, the energy of what it takes to preach a sermon. And uh, I was reading it and it was talking about one sermon is almost equivalent to an eight hour workday in its, in its mental, physical energy to try to do that and be able to memorize things and preach it in a communicative way. You've, your brain is like the whole time to do that. It's almost like an eight hour workday. So here's Jesus preaching this sermon. All right, give me a raise. Preaching this sermon. All right, and He's tired, man. He's been healing people. He's been doing, and he, so he gets in and he goes away with the disciples and, and he gets in, uh, in a boat and he goes to the other side, which is the Sea of Tiberias, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. It would have been about a four mile journey. All right, I went and looked it up. I even did the math for you because I'm sure we don't even like, we're like, I don't know, man, you're on a boat four miles. What is that, nine hours? We have no idea. It's about a one hour and 20 minute walk. So if you picture walking with your buddies, it's about a four miles or it's about a 45 minute sail. And here's what I love about this. In this moment, Jesus ain't doing anything, right? It's just one of those like, like, you know, like, it's been said, I can't remember who said it years ago. They said like movies and TV, they're basically, you know, life with all the boring parts taken out, right? It's like, you don't want to watch a show and just a guy sitting watching television for like 35 minutes. That's not a show, right? Like you're bored. But here's Jesus having a boring moment. And I love this because he's just sailing. And, and, and John's like, I'm not even gonna tell you kind of what, it's almost like, I, I picture, like this is one of those, like they talk, 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 talk all the time. There's so much going on. He just preaches and they all get in the boat and they're, and they're like, I got an hour long sail or whatever. And they just sit there in silence. It's like, is he gonna say anything profound? It's just like, geez, like, they just chill it. Like, it's like my, uh, uh, my brother-in-law is visiting uh, from Toronto right now, and we were driving in the car yesterday, and uh, and we were literally in the car for 20 minutes, and we didn't say anything to each other. We just played the Beach Boys. All right, we had kids in the back there, and East Coast girls, I have not really dig those. Uh, so anyway, so, and we just didn't talk, right? It's like, if you had a camera, this is really a bank bank and the girls, like, serving you. So, so it's like, Maybe it's just utter silence and blinks and nothing, but I love that because here's the reality. Uh, you could look at Jesus and go, what are you doing? You gotta go save the world, get at it. What are you wasting an hour sailing across doing nothing for him? And that's the point. If Jesus could do it, guys, you can do it. Some of you are tired, you're, you're burned out. You're thinking, how can I... Not many of you are going to be called to lead a global movement and, and lead a national thing to bring thousands of people to Christ. And, and you're not, met, most of you are probably not going to be called to that in your life. And so it's this question of what even Jesus said, you know, there's moments where I'm just going to pour into the 12 in the boat. 
right? And, and here's the thing, you can do 12, guys, right? You might, don't get overwhelmed by the thought of everything you think your life is supposed to be. Even sometimes when I preach to you, I say, you're gonna change the world for Christ, give up everything, move your death, sell everything. You know, and it's like, sometimes we mistake discipleship for leadership. Like there are people who are called to do more than other people in regard to some of the stuff that they do and the time and the energy, but all of us are called you got 12, you got a few friends, you got your family you can pour into, you got people that you can go, this is what I, who am I actually gonna pour into? These are the people I'm gonna spend time with. So here's Jesus just doing nothing. And I love it because it's ordinary. And God is in the ordinary, guys. And you gotta look, you gotta see that. He's in the walk where you say and do nothing for the king. He's there. He's, it's just, there's something to that. And some of you just need to be told that because you need to be set free from this continuous get, produce, produce, produce. Be effective, get results. And sometimes Jesus did stuff, didn't have results. I love... Um, you guys know I love C.S. Lewis and one of the biographers writing about him. Listen to, listen to a couple of these uh, paragraphs. Uh, here's uh, here's uh, C.S. Lewis saying this, before I became a Christian, I do not think I fully realized that one's life after conversion would inevitably consist in doing most of the things one had been doing before. One hopes in a new spirit, but still the same things. Christianity does not exclude any of the ordinary human activities. St. Paul tells us whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do to the glory of God. All our merely natural activities will be accepted if they're offered to God, even the humblest and all of them. Even the noblest will be sinful if they are not. If they are not given him, if God is not infused in the most normal things. Now, Here's what one of the students at Oxford said about C.S. Lewis. Now, here's a guy writing books, doing lectures, becomes world famous for everything he does. And here's what one of the students said. Most of the time I was an undergraduate, he went home to his house in Headington in the evenings, though I think he spent all his days in the college. He once said how irritating it was that one seemed to get one's best ideas with both hands in hot water, doing the dishes, unable to make notes. One of my friends after the war expressed his regret at his own lack of domesticity. And Lewis said, ah, you have too little of it and I have too much. And then Lewis said, during your prayers, uh, he once counseled as you pray to be conformed more and more to the likeness of Christ, you may realize that instead of saying your prayers, you ought to be downstairs writing a letter or helping your wife to wash up, well, go and do it. That's what Lewis lived this really crazy life where he's at this house with this woman and he was taking care of her kid and just constantly buying groceries and like just, do, he did all of that and, and did crazy stuff for the kingdom of God in the midst of the normalcy. He wasn't just sitting in some Oxford you know, room writing and writing and writing so he could change the world. He was a normal, in the everyday, he infused those moments with God. And this is what, this kind of idea. Now, some of you are just too tired and some of you are actually facing burnout. One of my friends, Kerry Newhoff, wrote a book um, called Didn't See It Coming and explains his burnout and he explains what to do about it. And in it, he talks about the idea that if we never take a break, we will break, right? And he, and he, and he gives signs of burnout. So let me just break down some of these signs for you because some of you are overwhelmed and you've never gotten the boat and just gone across and done the nothing. Uh, he says, here's some, here's some signs that you're actually going through burnout in your life. Number one, your passion fades. Your pa is your passion fading for life, for whatever God has called you to? Number two, you no longer feel the highs and the lows. Your main emotion, all it's just numbness. It's just kind of you're flatlined. You don't feel like, oh, the laughs and the uh, crying. You just kind of go through at a median level. Number three, little things make you disproportionately emotional. There's times in your life when stuff overwhelms you and that's normal, but maybe in this moment, 
this little thing completely overwhelms you. Like at this moment, now you're, you're sitting up as one meme I, I saw this week. It's, it's a guy sitting in his bed and it's like me at 2 a.m. saying to myself, I need to sell all my stuff and move into the forest, right? At 2 a.m., doesn't all of life like feel overwhelming, but you're having those moments in the normal hours of the day. Maybe you're burning out. Uh, number four, he says, everybody drains you. Every person, every scenario feels overwhelming. Number five, you've become cynical. You, ju- you, just, you just can't get, you can't get past in the negative reality. You're cynical about everything, cynical about that person, cynical about that event, cynical about that. Everything overwhelms you in regard to cynicism and you, you've stopped being a positive person. Number six, nothing seems to satisfy you. You just can't get satisfaction in life. It seems ever elusive, like you're continuously going after it. Uh, Number seven is you can't think straight. You're fuzzy. You can't just kind of make decisions in a focused way. Number eight, your productivity is dropping. You just can't, you're not productive at all. Number nine, he says you're self-medicating. You're doing drugs. You're drinking too much. You shop too much. You look at porn. Burnout. These are a sign of it. And And you just constantly medicate yourself in order to feel something or to numb yourself against feeling something. Number 10, you don't laugh anymore. I remember golfing with a guy recently. I'm gonna give a couple of golf illustrations of this sermon. Uh, and, he, and, I, and I forced him, he had a meeting and I was like, don't go to that meeting and just kind of wooed him away from me. And we played another 18 and he called the person. He's like, I'll meet you later. And he looked at me and he says, you know what? I, don't, I think I forgot to have fun. I forgot how to have fun. And this is, you know, and I'm like, right. This is, this is maybe that's you. Like you just, that has gone from your life and you're about one task to the next task and you're feeling overwhelmed by things. And then sleep and time off no longer refuel you. These are all signs, Kerry says, of burnout. So then he gives uh, four or five things that we're supposed to do about it. One, tell someone. You are never meant to live life alone. I mean, look at this verse. Jesus is with his disciples. Even Jesus himself literally never walked alone in this life. Like he was constantly with people, constantly with his disciples in community and in your life, family, friends, mentors, people who you can just detach from with even and just enjoy the small things in life. Uh, This week, uh, I went away for uh, this annual golf trip that we do for, it was actually just one day, but usually we do two or three days and it's for my birthday. Uh, And we, we went away and, and it, was just, it was just nonsense for a day, right? It was just golfing and cheesy bread at the keg and, and telling dumb stories and laughing and making fun of each other all day and then just hugging at the end. Just, just some, 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 do you have people that you just can do that with? Like that you just share life with, that you just journey with. These are the moments that refuel you, that give you life to be able to then come out of it and pour into others. Um, Uh, Number two, develop a circle around you. Same idea. Tell someone, develop a circle around you, do it in communion. Number three, leaning into God because the the, the answer to your problems is not going to be material. It's going to be spiritual. So God has to be involved. And number four, make sure you rest. If you're someone someone at our office who just tends toward workaholism asked me the other day, how do you defeat this thing in life, workaholism? And literally, guys, because it was probably my life when we planted Village Church for the first eight years, um, I had to pray it out. I had to pray out and I asked the Lord to give me a passion for other things. And that's what he did. And now it's like, I don't know what it is. It's like over the last couple of years of my life, it's like I take far more joy, not just in being productive. Like there's a million opportunities in my life that I turn down. People, oh, let's start a podcast and reach millions. I'm like, nah. It's like, I, I just want to like, I want to sit on the porch with my dog and, and help my middle daughter with her, her, her canker sore cream, you know, like last night. I was like, and I just sat there with her for 20 minutes. I'm like, I'm supposed to be sermon prepping. It's like, or I can just sit with her as she hug her and cry. Like this is infused. These moments, these are the moments, man. This is what I take. Like I take far more joy in that now than I did five years ago. And I had to pray into that and go, let me care about these things more than I do these things at certain times because this is what you've called me to in the end. This in the end is my greatest responsibility. And so 
I think part of it is getting God involved. I uh, had this vision this week. I'm like, wrote down on my whiteboard as a guy prayed over me, plant 100 churches by 2030. And I'm like, you know what? That could be a thing. I'm not announcing that quite yet, but uh, maybe that's a thing. And it could be, and that gets me excited. But a piece of me also just loves the idea. Like, like this week, I also looked up, what are, the, what are the five greatest novels written by American writers in the 20th century? And I'm cracking open John Steinbeck, East of Eden. And I'm going, what is it, what is it like to read a masterpiece? Like these moments, I know that's probably not gonna help me plant 100 churches by 2030, but it doesn't matter. That's the point, because in the end, it kind of does, because that refuels so I can come back out better. So the point is that some of us are feeling the burn out. And you got to realize that when you take, like I was uh, in a, in a um, golf tournament this week, third golf <laughs> point in the last five minutes. Um, but man, let me, like, so it was for Wagner Hills, which is this recovery center out here in, in British Columbia uh, for alcoholics and drug addicts and uh, and every hole, they have residents of Wagner Hills at the hole. And it was this amazing thing because a lot of them, those of you from Wagner Hills, hello, shout out to you. Um, they watch the sermons and they, and they find hope in them and inspiration. And a bunch of them have met Jesus and, and got clean. It's just beautiful. And, and so there I am like trying to win this competitive golf tournament, right? I'm all jacked up. Oh, we just missed the birdie putt and I'm in that zone. And like, this matters. Like, I can't believe we missed that. You know, and I'll be driving up to the next hole. And I, and I see this, this guy and, and, he, and, and I walk up and it's just like big hug. And you're Pastor Mark, right? Like, like can I get a picture and tell you my story? And, and before I'm off that tee box, I'm like, this is what matters. Like this, man. Here's what your dumb little golf tournament did want to win. I lost. It's best like this. And in 18 of those tee boxes throughout the day, when you're hearing the, the story of addiction gone, freedom, inspiration, Jesus changed my life. It's like, it's very hard in those moments to care about missing a birdie book because this is what it's about right here. And I feel like I have more capacity now to take those moments in and to understand the meaning and depth of them than I did five years ago. These are all God graces. And, and what Newhoff is saying is the way you don't burn out is by making sure you take that rest. And so all of that is, I think, what, what's going on here. He's tired and he's taking a bit of a rest and he's going across the Sea of Galilee. He knew what it took to be healthy. And there's a difference between knowing what it takes to be healthy and actually doing it. And my wife and I are the person, she knows what it takes to be healthy. You eat right, you exercise. I know what it takes to be healthy. Here's the thing. Uh, one of us does that and the other one does not do that, all right? Erin knows what it takes and does it. Every morning she's up, she's on her machine, boom, boom, boom. I'm sitting there blah, blah, eating some nonsense. She's like eating some like healthy thing. And I'm like, yeah, I was like, but she got more energy. She's in the zone. She's in emotionally, physically, spiritually. All these things are zoning in. I'm like, yeah, I try to catch up. You know, drinking my, you know, it's coffee and sitting around eating nonsense and never actually, never lifted a weight. I don't know if you noticed this or not. I've never lifted. Well, it's like, I try to get the video team to pop. But it, the reality is, it's like, it's a difference between knowing and doing, guys. And most of you know what it takes to be emotionally, spiritually healthy, but you don't do it. You never back up. You never take the break and go, I got to spend this time with Jesus so I can re-enter the world. And if you don't take a break, you're going to break as a warning to you. Okay, all of that from Jesus got in a boat. <laughs> uh, so I'm probably not gonna get to the verses that I thought I was going to. Anyway, here we go. Verse two, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Remember, Jesus is doing these miracles and people are believing in Jesus because of miracles. And I love that. Like, let's just full stop. Don't be afraid to lean in and use praying for people's miracles as a form of which people could come to know Jesus. We tend to be scared of that. We tend to move away from that. And for good reason, of course, there's moments in the New Testament where Jesus goes, the people who are looking after a sign, they're never gonna last anyway. They're not gonna, and that's legitimate. I'll talk about that in a sec. But there are moments when I think we should 
pray into people's lives and hope that God actually shows up and does a miracle. There are no natural explanations for this. And so it, it, it actually begs the question of, is there something more powerful in the universe that could actually love me and save me? To not be afraid of those, because right here we see that that's why people are actually believing. Uh, know though, when, and, and this is the point, when he's doing these signs, it's the Greek word semion, um, when he's doing those signs, their displays, their marvels, he's doing them so that people, believe. they're not magic tricks, right? They're not like, he's not just doing stuff for the sake of it. Philip Yancey writes these words. He says, I readily concede that Jesus with a few dozen healings and a handful of resurrections from the dead did little to solve the problem of pain on this planet. That is not why he came though. Nevertheless, it was in Jesus' nature to counteract the effects of the fallen world during his time on earth. That's why he's doing them. As he strode through life, Jesus used supernatural power to set right what was wrong. The miracles give us a glimpse of what the world was meant to be and instill hope that one day God will right its wrongs. To put it mildly, God is no more satisfied with this earth than we are. Jesus' miracles offer a hint of what God intends to do about it. See, here's the thing. Uh, the miracles of Jesus aren't just left to themselves. They always point to something to authenticate the message of Jesus. The miracle is to authenticate the message, the message of the gospel, the message that God has come to reign and rule through Jesus Christ in a way that gives life through repentance and believing in the death and resurrection of Christ. They're all meant to point to that. They're not just making Joe's life better for the next 25 years so that he can die and then just go to a Christless eternity. That's not the point. They always have this symbol. And that's why, listen, I was on this uh, uh, this week I was on the Skeptics podcast, okay? So uh, they got in touch with me. They're a podcast in the UK and they're two people, two guys who were deconverted from Christianity. So uh, used to be pastors and missionary kids and grew up in Christianity and super scientific, philosophical, and just have walked away from Christianity and have an entire podcast dedicated to deconstructing Christianity and challenging everything about it. And so they asked me if I wanted to go out and I'm like, sure, why not? All right, sounds like a good way to spend an afternoon. So I'm going into the lion's den and they asked me on this podcast, if Jesus' miracles are legit, Mark, why can't we see them? Like, why can't, why isn't, why isn't YouTube filled with videos, not like you know, Bigfoot grainy videos in the forest. I'm talking about videos. You see the amputee's arm grow back, boom, get on a plane, verify it, God exists. Why doesn't he do that? Because then the two of us would believe. And I answered them in a way that they then said, uh, I have no idea what to do with that answer. I never expected you to say that and I'm not sure even how to respond. But my response is, I think, part of the point that we need to hear. You see, here's the reality. God doesn't always do those miracles because that's not what God is primarily about. Here's what I mean. My answer to them was this. I said, the assumption of your question is that God wakes up in the morning saying, my main task in life is to prove myself to people. My main thing I'm about right now is to do some stuff so that skeptics will believe I exist. But maybe that's not what God cares about. Maybe God's got 17 billion galaxies that he's sovereign over and he doesn't, he doesn't wake up going, oh, I hope I can convince people I exist today. When you bump into, because if that is actually what he's trying to do every day, he's doing a poor job of it. Wouldn't you agree? Like, and they're like, uh, what? And I'm like, don't, when you bump into Bible passages and they're like, you know what I care about above everything else? I care about my own glory. I care about my name going out into the world. And you bump up against passages like that, let them shake you because maybe God isn't who you think he is based on your 21st century latte drinking master's degree from your university. And who's supposed to change, God or you when you bump into passages like that? We're talking about the God who when you read Mark 4, I said, he, he, he tells parables and then the disciples go, wow, 
That parable, I have no idea what it means. There's seeds going into grounds. There's birds plucking things and flying. We have no idea what it even means. And Jesus' response isn't like, okay, everyone, chill out. Now I'm gonna explain every little detail. He does that sometimes. But he puts in this little phrase where he says, I tell parables so that the, the message will be hidden from people so that they won't understand. It's like, what are you talking about right now? Right? And I said all that. And they're like, okay, I've never thought about that. Like one guy literally went, I don't even know what to do now with this. Like, I don't even know where to go with this. And I think that's part of the point of what you and I have to understand that of course the miracle doesn't always happen. We got to go after it so people can believe, yes. But Jesus knew that when people believe just because the miracle, it's short term. Because when the miracle doesn't end up happening and that cancer diagnosis doesn't go away, then, then where's their faith? What's it built on? Because at some point we're all gonna die. At some point that miracle's not gonna happen the way we thought it would. And so your whole life can't be based on just the miracle. That's the point. It's gotta be deeper than that. And so Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. Again, away from the people, up to the mountain, rest. Now the Passover, the, uh, 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 the, the feast of the Jews is at hand. I will say this about that. Um, Three times, John, remember we saw the Passover in chapter two, uh, right after the, uh, he turns the water into wine, he, he throws the stuff over in the temple, and then it's all during the Passover. This passage tells us it's a Passover, and then there's another Passover to come. I say all that because, you know, John's the only reason we know that Jesus' ministry was three years. So you know how, like, we often talk about that? We go, Jesus did ministry for three years. If you only had the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you wouldn't know that. That thing could be done in, you know, two weeks. It's only John that we know three years because Jesus is involved in three different Passovers, which only happen once a year. And so... Here's Jesus at the Passover. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's the 4th of July. It's Christmas Eve. And this is what he says. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him. Of course, he's tired and now a large crowd again. Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? I love this. The reason he asks Philip, scholars tell us, is because Philip was from Bethsaida, where they are now. So it's kind of like you're traveling with your buddy, you're in a town you don't know, but he's from there and you go, where do we get pizza, bro? Like, where do we get good ice cream around this joint? Like, where, do you know the town? Where's the good coffee at? He asks Philip to do this thing. And what's Philip's response? Now, I, here's what I love about, why does he ask Philip to do this? Jesus knows he can feed 5,000 people he knows what he's about to do. He's not you and me. He, doesn't, he knows everything about the future. He knows everything that's in the hearts of men. He knows everything. He knows what he's about to do. He's about to feed 5, 10, 15, 20,000 people from nothing. But instead of just jumping right to it and like looking through the crowd and going, young child, Jeremy, <laughs> whatever, come to me. And the child like floats. Like this is what I would do. Right? Give me the fish. You know, he just goes, hey, fill up. What are my boys? Uh, what, do, what do you say? How can we feed these people? He involves Philip in something that God could do on his own. Paul's words for this in Corinthians are, we are co-laborers with Christ, you and me. We get to, we get the opportunity to actually co-labor and do the work that God is doing in the world. And we should be about it. We should do something with it. It's a beautiful thing that God asks us in our life to actually, and, and, and look, at, look at Philip's response, of course, and this is what we do oftentimes when we're asked to do something. He said this to test him, which I love, for he himself knew what he would do. That's what, literally what the text says. I'm testing you. So often we run from the testing, right, of God. We don't know what to do with it, but over and over, read James 1, read 1 Peter. The testing is to make you into who God's trying to make you into. It's like, Philip, I need you to be a particular kind of leader and I'm gonna test you. 
for he himself knew what he would do. Here's Philip's answer, and this is how often I answer when God asks me to do something that he could do by himself, but he wants to include me. He wants me to be a co-laborer. He wants me to partner with him as he wants you to partner with him. Hey, I need your money to do something great. Hey, I need your time and your talent and your skill to do something great. Hey, I want the opportunity to love on that person. Hey, I want the opportunity to do this. Hey, plant churches, do that. Love that person. Go over and make them a meal. Whatever it is for you, he asks you to do it even though he can do it himself. It's this beautiful partnership. And yet sometimes how do we do it? Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. 200 denarii, a denarii was one day, 12 hours labor and what you'd get paid. So what he's saying is it would take eight months of my salary to feed all these people. Jesus asks a question. Where can we get bread to feed these people? And Philip answers, how much would it cost? He answers the question that Jesus ain't asking. And this is what I do, right? Jesus goes, do this. And I go, but I don't know. We see in a glass darkly. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. We don't really clearly understand what God asks us to do. And so sometimes we mess it up. Now, the beautiful thing is he's gonna continue using Philip just like Jesus does with us when we totally fumble the ball. My, uh, my 10-year-old jumped into the backseat of my truck the other day and I'm like, she knows I like it clean. I like to keep it, yeah. She jumps in there, she's got a can of something and she goes, dad, don't worry about it. Literally jumps in, tries to get the seatbelt, bobbles it all over the place. I'm over here talking, I come in, I look through the window and you should see her face. It's like <sighs> terrified that I was gonna come in and just roast her, right? And I open the door, I'm like, what's this? She's like, uh, uh, sorry, it's spilled, I know, I do. And it's like, in this moment, I could be that guy or I could be like Jesus. <laughs> and so I was like Jesus. I was like, it's fine, everything's cool, man. It's great. It's all good. This is just life, right? This is what Jesus, uh, he asks this, we do it that way. He goes, I love you anyway. I'm gonna keep using you even though you're silly and dumb. So this is what God gets us to do. He asks us to participate. My buddy Lou told me the other day, and I'll give you a good story of Lou because I beat up on him so often. He, <laughs> Lou's become kind of famous in these sermons, <laughs> but I usually razz him. So let me give you a good one. I was talking to him this week and he said he was in a grocery store last week and he was shopping and uh, he saw this lady, she had two or three kids and her kids were a disaster. They were screaming and yelling and crying and grabbing things and throwing them all over the place. And, uh, and, and God just spoke to him and just said, you need to walk up to her and encourage her. Now this is the problem in life, right? We have these opportunities, but we, we, we're scared to take them because we're scared of the outcome. We don't know where it's gonna go. We don't know if God's gonna show up. We don't know if it's gonna be weird. And so we tend to run away from those opportunities. And he just said, no, okay, I'm gonna do it. God spoke. I don't know if it was, you know, some, some bad pizza or, you know, whatever, but I'm gonna go do it. So he walks up to her and he says, hey, I just wanna tell you something. Because all the people are looking at her like as she's, she's flushed, as she's freaking out. All the people are like, and all these, Rah! you know, people in the grocery store. Like, calm down, you miserable people in the grocery store. It's like, you're, YOLO, man, just chill. You're, you're, your, your mayonnaise is going to be there when you get there, all right? So he looks at her and he goes, hey, I just want to tell you something. You're a good mom. And she looked up from her tears. She said, really? And he's like, you're a good mom. Now, obviously, he didn't know whether she was a good mom. But he needs to encourage her. And she's like, oh, my goodness, thank you for saying that. And just her whole demeanor changed. All of life, guys, is those moments. Do this little thing right. I just need you to co-labor with me. I need you to show up. I need you to show up. Uh, last week, I had preached about, a couple weeks ago, I'd preached about going to visit this young man who was passing away. Uh, and, and I had gone to visit him and then I preached about it. And the day that sermon played, uh, his family was watching it. And that evening, he passed away. And he had come to know Jesus over COVID by watching these sermons. And he, he said as one of his last wishes to come, that he would, I would come and, and meet him. 
uh, which is so strange because like I'm nobody. I'm a, I'm a beggar telling other beggars where to get bread. I'm, I am nonsense. I am stu- silly and dumb. And, and the fact that God uses me to encourage anybody. Uh, but what they gave me was an opportunity to just show up and be present and be obedient in a very small thing. And that small thing, you know, multiplied like what Jesus is about to do that we're probably not gonna have time for yet. So we'll come back to it next week. Uh, multiplied out exponentially to impact this family and this life. The small little things that you think aren't meaningful. The things you're afraid to do, the things you're nervous about, the things you're not comfortable with because you're worried about the outcome, the things that feel weird to you. And so... Jesus says, hey, we got to feed these people. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, I love this, uh, said, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are are they for so many? Uh, You know what I never noticed until I I, I was studying this this week? Um, Andrew's the one who actually, so (laughs) I love this, man. Philip, I need you to solve a problem, okay? Okay, boss, I'm on it. What do you want me to do? I need you to feed all you. Well, here's the thing. Logical, cold math tells me we need to work eight months. Everybody take eight months. We'll go feed these people. And Andrew shows up from the side and solves it. The guy who's asked doesn't solve it. Another guy solves it. And Jesus uses him then. I love that. Jesus is not gonna not do the kingdom thing. He's just gonna use someone else. If you pass on it, he'll just use someone else. And then the question is, and this is in our culture, brutal. Can Philip celebrate Andrew's win? That's how you know a true friend is with you. When you succeed and they don't get jealous, but they celebrate. This is an epidemic in the church. Pastors are so small-minded and grovelly and ego. Oh, you had success. I don't like you. And you're, oh, I don't. And and you're you're not doing it right. I remember... um, I was uh, on a, a panel uh, one time. We were talking about doing video sermons and how I wasn't able to preach all the campuses, so we did video. And the guy's like, well, video, you know, that's not real church. And, uh, and I remember talking to someone after, man, man, that's like tough critique because I just want to try to reach people for Jesus. <clears throat> and the guy goes, you know what? I like your wrong way of doing things that's reaching people better than his right way of doing things that ain't reaching people. And it's like, oh, right, right. Like we, you couldn't celebrate a kingdom win, bro. You had to start talking about my methodology. But here's the thing, guys, when it comes to methodology in life, as, as, as uh, one of my uh, uh, mentors once said, um, judge the fruit, don't judge the watering schedule. Right, like, like if someone has fruit in their life that's God honoring, and you start getting in the game, but how did they do the thing? It's like, buddy, they grew it and, and they, they watered it at five in the morning, but not 10 p.m. It doesn't Like, what are we, if Jesus isn't clear about the methodology, then we get creative. And, we use, and so here, are you able to celebrate the kingdom wins of other people? Because Jesus will use other people 100%. There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? What are we gonna do with these Okay, so, so here's what we got to understand. Um, a boy in that culture, see, we got helicopter parenting where we, where we like celebrate kids all that we love. Kids, kids, everybody's okay. Like, yeah, yeah, but we love kids. We worship kids. In that culture, they were like, get out of here, kid. You're a pest. All right, so there's a boy who has five barley loaves. Now, we just pass over that. But literally, barley was what poor people used. It was the cheapest of all bread. So not only do you have a useless kid, all right? It's like, it's like my, uh, my, my nephews are uh, three boys visiting right now. One of them's two. Just useless as, as just, just so like just pound, just runs into the door. Just like. We have, like, we're working on a, we got a hole in our backyard right now. He just, he just like a diver right into it. Just like, this kid is, you, there's nothing we can do with this kid. That's how that culture, you know, is like, just awake. So here we got a boy. You know, God could never use this useless. 
but God does use the useless things of the world. That's one of our main messages as a church. And I'm the example of it. It's 1 Corinthians. He uses the stupid, foolish, moronic in the Greek things of the world to bring him glory, just like you. So if you feel like your past doesn't live up, if you feel like you've sinned too much, if you feel like you're not smart enough, bright enough, rich enough, stop it. Those are lies of the enemy because what Jesus uses here is a useless boy, nameless doesn't even have a name, just boy. You, you, know, you know, often the gospel writers stop and they go, that was the son of Timaeus and the father of... Nath-. Like they always do that. Now it's like, boy, just, just nameless character. Give me stuff. And then the barley loaves, see in the movies, he comes up and he's got like these big... Ra- like, he's got these big barley loaves. These things were for the poor. So William Barclay, a New Testament scholar, he says this, there is a regulation in the Mishnah, which is teachings of, uh, about the Torah, about the offering that a woman who has committed adultery must bring. With all offerings of food, they were made, uh, consisted in flour and wine and oil intermixed. Ordinarily, the flour used was made of wheat, but it was laid down that in the case of an offering for adultery, the flour could be barley, for barley is the food of animals and the woman's sin was the sin of an animal, like a w- woman who committed adultery. Barley bread was the bread of the very poor and the very hopeless. Just like you. Just like you feel sometimes when you've committed that sin. In Jesus' hands, your life, as useless as it is, can multiply out to bless so many people, it's unbelievable. Your deposit in other people can multiply exponentially in the hands of Jesus because he's the great multiplier. That's the point. And he's gonna create manna for these people. And then it says, and two fish. I love this uh, because the Greek word for fish here is not the normal word for fish. The normal word for fish is a Greek word, ichthus. This is the Greek word, opserion. Now, here's literally what it means. Uh, One of the lexicons says it's already cooked fish, pickled, salted, that they would eat with bread. It would be more like a sardine from the Sea of Galilee. So we see the movies and the the guys walk up, they got all this bread and they got these two big fat fish and they're like, Jesus, what do we do with this? He starts going, woo, and he multiplies that. We're talking little pickled things and a couple of the poorest, cheapest garbage bread you can get. And Jesus takes it and does this beautiful miracle and multiplies it out to actually feed these people. But what are they for so many? They say, Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves and when he'd given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish as much as they wanted. I love this. He gives thanks. He prays, God, you're included in just this little, little bread that we're actually eating, this little thing that we're doing in our life. You're involved in the intricate details of it. He distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. Here's this pining, this need, and Jesus ain't cheap. Some of you are cheap. Some of you hold back. There's not a generosity. There's a spirit of scarcity. And Jesus gives over abundance. And let me close by telling you this. When I read that, the overabundance the non-cheapness, the non-holding back. So much so, look at uh, when they'd eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. Gather them up. There's leftovers because Jesus does more, not less. We're asking bare, what's the bare minimum? And he's going over and above. And here's what I thought about in regard to the cross. The cross is that moment where God doesn't hold back. You know, one, one writer, when I was, I was reading their commentary on, uh, on giving and generosity, and they were talking about the idea that in the Old Testament you would tithe, but of course Jesus doesn't tithe his blood. 
He doesn't give, te- he gives it all. He gives his whole life. And so what, what is it to us to actually be generous and to give out of a place of, of, of overabundance versus scarcity? And in the cross, that's where that begins. The only place we become the kinds of people who give out of an overflow of generosity is because our heart and mind and life and money get saved by the cross of Christ and the resurrection. And so I invite you to know the one who multiplies out and gives you more than you deserve. He's the one who sets free. He's the one who can take your little life and multiply it out 30, 60, and 100 fold. And I pray, God, that you would do that to all watching, to all listening, that we would see, A, in this miracle that you're exposing the fact that you're God and that that would be the, like you're just doing something to these people that they knew the echoes of that you'd done before. But that in our life, we would recognize it has everything to do with us trusting you in all things to show up, to do the miracle that we didn't, I I can't tell you how many times I've doubted you, Lord, like Philip, even though I've seen you do the miracle, do the village church and accomplish it, even though the vision was like, I don't know what to do. Start a golf tournament where we hope to raise this and exponentially rose and, and the people who've met you and the people who've been healed at our church and the, and the, and the, the, the wife you've given me and the kids you've, like all of these, I've seen you do it a hundred times and yet still I get to that point and I doubt it and I just pray, Jesus, burn that away from me and help me to trust that you can do something if I just show up. And I pray that you would take my little life, my little skills, my little gifts that you've given me in the moment and the time that I have right now and use it to affect as many as you would see fit in this moment. In Jesus' great name we pray, amen. 